I would now request the department chaplain for the Rhode Island Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War, Brother Daniel Shippey, to open our event with an invocation. The invocation will be followed by our national anthem played by the Providence Brigade Band, so please remain standing after the prayer. Before delivering this morning's invocation, I wish to thank Brother Brian Gio for providing the original prayer of the Grand Army of the Republic. Let us pray. Almighty Father, humbly we bow before thee, our creator, preserver, guide, and protector. We thank thee for our lives, for thy mercy which has kept us until this hour, for thy guidance on land and sea, by day and by night for thy constant care in our hours of danger, and for the preservation of our national integrity and unity. Be graciously near to our comrades who suffer from disease or wounds, and to the widows and orphans of those who fell in our holy cause. In all distresses, comfort them, and give us willing hearts and ready hands to supply their needs. Bless our country, grant that the memory of our noble dead, who freely gave their lives for the land they loved, may dwell ever in our hearts. Bless our order. Make it an instrument of great good. Keep our names on the roll of thy servants, and at last receive us into that grand army above, where thou, O God, art the supreme commander. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All units, raises. At this time, I'd like to read several documents that have been prepared for this occasion. The first document is a gubernatorial citation entitled, Rhode Island's Day of Commemoration for Elijah Hunt Rhodes. Whereas Elijah Hunt Rhodes was an American soldier 
who served in the Union Army of the Potomac for the entire duration of the American Civil War, rising from private to colonel of the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteer Infantry. And whereas the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteer Infantry was Rhode Island's fighting regiment, firing the opening volleys at the first Battle of Bull Run and remaining in the line till the final events at Appomattox. And whereas Elijah Hunt, Hunt Rhodes is most remembered for the wartime journal and letters publishes all for the Union. And whereas Rhodes returned to become a successful Rhode Island businessman after the war and remained most active in Veterans Affairs as well as serving as Brigadier General in the Rhode Island State Militia. And whereas General Rhodes served in the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States and in the Grand Army of the Republic, including one year as its National Senior Vice Commander. And whereas, though we seek not to honor war, we continue to honor the sacrifice and dedication of our warriors from all our conflicts. Now, therefore, I, Lincoln D. Chafee, Governor of the State of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, do hereby proclaim July 19th, 2014, as Rhode Island's Day of Commemoration for Elijah Hunt Rhodes in Rhode Island, and encourage all state residents to join me in recognizing the importance of this day given under my hand and the great seal of the state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations this 18th day of July 2014. Lincoln D. Chafee. The second document I have to read states, I, Angel Tavares, Mayor of the City of Providence, do hereby confirm upon you this citation of gratitude for the tribute you have organized on this day to commemorate the life and legacy of Elijah Hunt Rhodes, a Rhode Islander who began his service during the Civil War as a private and rose to the rank of colonel in the 2nd Rhode Island Infantry Regiment, and subsequently to that of Adjutant General after a rich and storied career during one of history's most horrific martial conflicts. The Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War, Department of Rhode Island, and the numerous societies and groups who are participating in this tribute deserve the warmest thanks of the people of Providence for keeping alive the flame of remembrance for one who, without reserve, devoted his entire being to the cause of the preservation of the Union and serves as an inspiration to all Americans, given under the seal of the mayor of the city of Providence this 19th day of July, 2014. Brother McGuire, could you take these documents? Brother McGuire will present the proclamation from the governor to Mr. Robert Rhodes, who represents the descendants of Elijah Hunt Rhodes. Uh, Mr. Rhodes will then come to the podium to highlight the life of his great-grandfather. I bring greetings from the Rhodes family and relatives. Um, I was asked to talk about the personal life of Elisha Rhodes with his family. And um, so, in the beginning, in the beginning, Zachariah Rhodes came from England in 1636, along with William Arnold and his family, which included his son Stephen Benedict and daughter Joanna, who married Zachariah in 1646. Her brother, Benedict Arnold, was an early governor of Newport. One of his grandsons of the same name from Connecticut was the Revolutionary War general, hero, and ultimately traitor. The Arnolds and Rhodes families own much property in Providence, Metuxet. If you look up Zachariah Rhodes and Joanna Arnold on the internet, you will be, you'll be surprised to see thousands of descendants listed in their genealogies. 
um, which includes President George Walker Bush through his mother's family. Um, Zebedee Hunt married Catherine Potter in 1760. Five or six generations later, Elisha Hunt Rhodes and Caroline Pierce Hunt, who were very distant cousins, were married in 1866, right after the Civil War. They had known each other apparently since childhood. The Rhodes family is also descended directly from Roger Williams, the Sheldons, Carpenters, Gortons, Holdens, Arnolds, Greens, Remingtons, Watermans, Aborns, Knights, and other early settlers of Rhode Island. The, the two old cemeteries in Patuxet are filled with generations named Captain Robert or Captain William Rhodes, and also girls named Eliza and Emily, who died in young, and the next child was given the same name. Many ancestors were sea captains sailing out of Providence and Patuxet. Some were privateers with letters of mark from the colonial government to attack British ships. Elisha used to like to uh, tease his wife Caroline. The only way she got into the DAR was because her ancestors were pirates. Uh, the first Elisha Hunt Rhodes, born in 1805, was a captor in the Patuxet Artillery during the war, Door War in 1842. He also was master of Harmony Lodge, Masons, and he taught Sunday school at the Patuxet Baptist Church. After serving master of several schooners, he became captain of the schooner Worcester, launched the day of the opening of the Providence and Worcester Railroad. He sailed up and down the Atlantic Sea Coast from Providence to New York and Philadelphia, Charleston, North Carolina, New Orleans, and Mobile, carrying lumber and cotton. The Worcester was shipwrecked in a hurricane in December 1858, and Elisha and his brother-in-law, John Adamson, were buried arm in arm in a single grave on Linyard's Key in the Bahamas. A very long funeral oration a copy of which still exists, was given at the Baptist Church in Patuxet for about 400 people, with many people standing outside. At this time, his eldest son, Elisha Hunt Rhodes Jr., was 16, and he became the breadwinner for his mother, Eliza and Chase Rhodes, and his brothers and sisters. He worked as a clerk for Frederick Miller, who became his mentor and close friend, and after the war, his business partner selling leather belts to run machinery and mills. With ancestors in the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and the Dorr Rebellion in Rhode Island, Elisha was very patriotic. At President Lincoln's call for troops to save the Union in 1861, at age 19, Elisha joined the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteers Infantry. I found recently that on February 24th, 1864, while still serving in the Civil War, Elisha purchased his family home in Patuxet for his remaining siblings, Mary E. Brown of Dover, New Hampshire, Emily C. Rhodes of Cranston, and Sarah Barton of Lawrence, Mass., with provision for their mother to live rent-free in the home for the rest of her life. There were nine children born to Elisha Hunt Rhodes I and Eliza Ann Chase Rhodes. Um, only a few lived to be um, uh, adults. Um, I'll talk about those buried here at Swan Point Cemetery. Elisha Rhodes was the first to be buried here in 1917. His wife of 50 years, Caroline, followed in 1930. Next was Annie Pierce Webb Rhodes in 1938. She was the wife of Elisha's son, Frederick Miller Rhodes Sr., who followed in 1942, and I remember him, the only grandparent I remember. Then came their son, a grandson of Elisha and Caroline, James Webb Rhodes in 1965, and he's buried over here. He gave me Elisha's writings and journal, now published as All for the Union, which was quoted from by Ken Burns. Then Marion Sykes Rhodes, my mother, wife of Frederick Miller Rhodes, Jr. in 1967, and Frederick, Jr., another grandson of Elisha and Caroline's, was buried here in 1986. At that time, 
Oh, after that, James Frederick Rhodes, great-great-great-grandson of Elisha Caroline and son of Eugene Knight Rhodes and Edna Beatty Rhodes, was buried here in 2005 behind the monument. Um, Eugene, a great-grandson of Elisha's, died in 2002, and his wife Edna in 2007, uh, buried in a newer part of the cemetery. Uh, William Frederick Rhodes Sr., my brother, was buried in another plot a couple of streets over that way in 1993. He was a great-grandson of Elisha and Caroline and son of Fred, Ju Fred Jr. and Marion Rhodes. Elisha Hunt Rhodes II, grandson of Colonel Elisha, was buried in Mashasic Cemetery in Pawtucket in 1938, and his wife, Irma Idella Knight Rhodes in 1975. The Howard and Alice Caroline Rhodes Chase plot contains the remains of Elisha and Caroline's daughter Alice Caroline and her son Robert Rhodes Chase Sr., who was a grandson of Elisha's and his wife Olive Tuck Chase. Is Bob Chase here? Ah, my cousin. <laughs> The Hunt family is all buried in North Burial Ground. One Sunday I attended the Community Church of Providence and I introduced myself to an usher and he immediately said, oh, you were born in 1937. And I was just amazed and I thought, how did he know that? And I asked him and he said, I'm a guide at Swan Point Cemetery and I see your name on the side of the monument, which is right here. So I am now the eldest remaining Rhodes, and I expect I'll be the next to be planted in this plot, which is right under this podium, by coincidence. <laughs> Other remaining great-grandchildren of Elisha's are Caroline Francis Chase and her brother Robert Rhodes Chase, Jr. Elisha and his offspring were known for their discipline, dignity, and also their wit. When quite elderly, Caroline and three grandsons were seated around the dinner table discussing doing somersaults. Caroline said, well, I can still do that. And gathering her long skirt, she somersaulted around the table. Some of Elisha's writings show his great sense of humor and love of pranks, much like Mark Twain's. I'm working sometimes on a bi biography of him based on his writings and a trip he took down south and all the pranks he got engaged in. I am not sure, I am sure that Elisha was not a saint but I have found only good things about him from his extensive correspondence with friends, Civil War veterans, and governors. The letters are all very respectful and warm. His fine reputation is a challenge for his descendants to live up to, as he has become a Rhode Island legend. His grandsons told of his stories about Johnny Mudd, which must have been based on his experiences. Despite some of his horrendous war experiences, he was, seems to remain free of what we now call post-traumatic stress syndrome, probably because of his lack of serious physical wounds, his strong belief in God, the love of his life, Caroline, and their family and many friends, and the many good works in which they took part in helping others. We are still a young country. Elisha was born in 1842, only 66 years after 1776. He died in 1917, only 20 years before I was born. Caroline lived until 1930, and I have a picture of her holding my brother as a baby. Looking at the world today, I say, blessed are the peacemakers. Elisha and Caroline produced 27 descendants directly, 10 of whom are deceased and 17 are alive. The living great-grandchildren now, uh, myself, and Caroline Francis Chase and Robert Rhodes Chase Jr., living great-great-grandchildren, Christine Rhodes Holden, Marsha Rhodes Truesdale, Susan Elizabeth Haining, William Frederick Rhodes Jr., living great-great-great-grandchildren, James Frederick Rhodes Jr., Michael Eugene Rhodes, Emily Daniela Rhodes, Diana Rhodes Truesdale Comtois, Stephen Rhodes Truesdale, Kira Rhodes Haining Drugan, Kyle Rhodes Haining, and living great, 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 that's four, 
grandchildren, Molly Rhodes Comtois, Benjamin Paul Comtois, and Evan George Comtois. I want to express my appreciations for you all for coming and for Brian Geo for being the mastermind for this whole um, ceremony. Thank you very much. As an interlude, the Providence Brigade Band will now perform the vacant chair, which was written to commemorate the death of Lieutenant John William Grout of the 15th Massachusetts Infantry, killed at the Battle of Ball's Bluff in 1861. I would now like to invite Mr. John A. Currier, commander of the Elijah Hunt Rhodes Camp 11, Sons of the Union veterans of the Civil War, to offer his comments on the military career of Colonel Rhodes. Members of the Rhodes family, other distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, greetings. A brief recounting of the Civil War service of Elijah Hunt Rhodes. Elijah was but of 19 years of age when the war began, and obtaining permission from his mother to answer President Lincoln's call for volunteers, he attempted to enlist. Though he was initially rebuffed in his attempts due to his slight stature, he displayed the strength of character that would be a hallmark of his entire life. That, coupled with his ability to both read and write, allowed for him to be mustered into the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteer Infantry Regiment on the 5th of June, 1861. He was promptly promoted to Corporal of Company D 
and saw action at the First Battle of Bull Run. He rose rapidly through the enlisted ranks and became Sergeant Major on the 1st of March in 1862. In less than four months, he was commissioned a second lieutenant. He was also soon promoted to first lieutenant and took command of Company B, holding that position until November of 1863 when he was appointed regimental adjutant. During this time, the second regiment was actively engaged against the foe from eastern Virginia to the peninsula before the Confederate capital of Richmond and propelling Lee's invasion into Pennsylvania. Elijah re-enlisted, determined to see the war through to the end. On the third anniversary of his, enlisted, of his enlistment as a private, he was named commander of the regiment. He was promoted to captain and his commission was dated the 5th of May, 1864. Under the command of Major General Wright of the 6th Corps, the regiment saw action in the Shenandoah Valley Campaign, where he was breveted major for gallant conduct at Winchester. He returned with his regiment to Petersburg in December of 64 and was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in January of 65. He was breveted Colonel of United States Volunteers for gallant conduct at the charge of the rebel works at Petersburg. He would receive a full commission to Colonel on the 18th of July, 1865. Ten days later, he was honorably discharged after four years and two months of service, having participated in every campaign of the Army of the Potomac from First Bull Run to Appomattox Courthouse. Of his service, it can be said, he was respected and loved by the men who served under him. He was respected and admired by the officers who served alongside of him. And he was respected and trusted by the officers who commanded him. Thank you. Next, I'd like to present Commander Benjamin Frail of the Rhode Island Department Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War for his comments on the Grand Army of the Republic role played by Elijah Hunt Rhodes. Good morning everyone and thank you for coming. Elijah Hunt Rhodes was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic, a charter member and the first commander of Prescott Post 1 in Providence. In 1871, Elijah was the adjutant, assistant adjutant general of the Department of Rhode Island. Rising through the chairs very fast, in the following year, eight years, 1872 and 1873, Elijah became the, the department commander of the Rhode Island Grand Army of the Republic. In 1877, again, his enthusiasm and great interest helped him obtain the second highest position of the national level, he became senior vice commander-in-chief. Quite an accomplishment for his first few years in the organization. Elijah volunteered much of his time for his, for his beloved Prescott Post and never boasted about it. One of Elijah's lasting achievements was helping design the Prescott Post Monument in North Burial Ground Cemetery in Providence, Rhode Island. The statue, was con which consists of a 32-pound cannon on top of stone base, was erected in 1875. According to the Prescott Post roster of 1885, Elijah's duties of the post were anything to do with veterans' graves at North, Bar at North Barrow Ground. Also, he attended the Memorial Day ceremony, memorial service of Ulysses S. Grant in New York City as Brigadier General, representing the Rhode Island Militia. It's very hard to say everything Elijah really did with the Post because he belonged to so many other or related organizations that overlapped each other. Elijah's old scrap bo scrapbooks proved he beloved them, beloved his military career and service, and the fraternal organizations he served. In 1877, he was the Vice President of the Army of Army of the Potomac Society. That same year, the president of the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteers Infantry and Battery A Association. He also was the founder and first president 
of the Rhode Island Soldiers, Sailors, and Historical Society. Uh, this society would take the veterans' uh, writings and post them in publications throughout the state. He was also very interested and very much for the Sons of Union Veterans, now known as the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. On a letter dated June 26, 1915, it states, Dear General, at our last meeting of the prospective camp of Sons of Union Veterans, we decide to call our camp General Elijah Hunt Road's Camp 11 Sons of Union Veterans. I understand that Comrade J.R. Burgess has seen you since and that you requested it just be called Elijah Hunt Road's Camp 11. We will be more than pleased to follow your wishes in the matter and we will take this up at our next meeting. Today, Elijah Hunt Road's Camp 11 is still active, it's still a very strong camp in the Department of Rhode Island Sons of Union Veterans. It still has the same mis mission as past generations to perpetuate the memory of the Civil War soldiers and sailors. Until Elijah's death in 1917, he kept up a helpful and, helpful and active correspondence with the GAR members, of which he was very proud of till the day he died. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce Mr. John DeShanu, Commander of the Rhode Island Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States for his comments. Thank you, Jack. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Major Gio for organizing this event. It's really been a great blessing to be here, and I'm sure you all agree, so I just want to hand for Brian, please. <laughs> okay. There we go. Um, Brian asked me to speak about uh, Elisha Hunt Rhodes' participation in um, MOLIS, which stands for the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, or Loyal Legion for short, we'll call it that. Um, <clears throat> well, his participation was, from what I can tell, rather limited. He became a uh, member in 1892. This was a year before he um, retired as the uh, commanding general of the Rhode Island Militia. And I have not found any information that he uh, held any office within uh, the Loyal Legion and um, haven't found anything to indicate his participation. So that's limited. But um, Brian also asked me to explain a little bit about the Loyal Legion, which I, which I will. Um, it was founded by officers who had served uh, originally. The original group was those who had served as part of President Lincoln's Honor Guard uh, shortly after his assassination. And they realized quite rightly that they were, had just been part of a very historic event in um, certainly the United States history and arguably human history. And they realized that they wanted to uh, commemorate those um, you know, that association and uh, to form an organization that would keep its memory alive. Um, and back then, um, people were more, shall we say, class conscious than they are today, and they decided to pattern themselves after the uh, Society of the Cincinnati and the Aztec Club of 1847, which were organizations for officers and now their descendants who had served in the American Revolution and the uh, Mexican War, uh, respectively. Um, so in Mollis's case, they said, well, we'll have an organization for officers who served in the Union Armed Forces. And um, <clears throat> that's what happened. As far as Elisha Hunt Rhodes goes, it's very obvious. He uh, became active in the GAR early and uh, quickly became its senior, his national, the national senior vice commander in chief. Uh, so obviously the GAR was his first and his greatest love when it came to these organizations. Uh, so I'll just leave you with that thought. Um, I also like to mention that Augustus P. Davis, founder of the Sons of Union Veterans, was also a Mollus member, and that several uh, national commanders have been members of uh, both organizations. So you'll find some national commanders for the Sons of Union Veterans who were also national commanders of Mollus. So with that, I will um, turn the podium over, and I thank you very much. <coughs> I must apologize. I, I jumped the sequence. 
so if you're following the programs, I didn't, uh, I didn't recognize the president of the Rhode Island Civil War Roundtable, Mr. Mark Dunkelman, who is going to place an original Grand Army of the Republic flag on the gr grave of Colonel Rhodes. Uh, somehow I got his sequence after John Duchesneau. But thank you, Mark. Okay, in that, Colonel Rhodes was an active Mason throughout his life. At this time, I would also like to introduce the right worshipful Senior Grand Warden of the most ancient and honorable society of free and accepted Masons of the state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. And I rehearsed that title several times before. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stephen T. McGuire. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good day. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I bring you the greetings of the most ancient and honorable society of free and accepted Masons for the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations, especially those of our presiding grandmaster, most worshipful Wyman P. Hallstrom III, and this fine contingent of Freemasons that we have here with us today. And I thank you for being here, my brothers. I brought the greetings of the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons for Rhode Island and our most worshipful grandmaster. We're here to honor another most worshipful grandmaster, most worshipful Elijah Hunt Rhodes. Since the establishment of our Grand Lodge in 1791, there have been fewer than 200 brothers to have the title most worshipful. To us as Freemasons, this is not a title held, there is not a title held in higher esteem. Here is a brief synopsis of most worshipful brother Rhodes' Masonic story. He was a member of Harmony Lodge, number nine, and Harmony Lodge held its first meeting on May 7th, 1805. In 1808, Captain James P. Rhodes was admitted to the lodge. By April 26, 1923, five generations of the Rhodes family had joined Harmony Lodge. In 1827, the second member of the Rhodes family, Captain Elijah Hunt Rhodes Sr. joined the lodge. He remained a member through the anti-Masonic period, and in 1855, he was elected to serve as secretary. In 1858, the lodge was in need of a new Bible, and Brother Rhodes bought and presented one to the lodge. Four months later, he was lost with his ship in the West Indies and buried in the Bahamas. This was the tragic death of the father of the man we are here to honor, Elijah Hunt Rhodes, Jr., who has been duly noted, joined the Union Army before the outbreak of hostilities or just after, and was at every major battle from First Manassas to Appomattox. So while his dad was not there to welcome him to Freemasonry and explain to him what the craft was about, he obviously had some exposure to it. The Civil War saw many, um, many men see what Masonry was about in strange ways because there were Masons on both sides of the conflict. Um, there's a famous story towards the end of the war of a, uh, a Union officer named William McKinley, who you probably know, uh, went on to become President of the United States. And he saw a Union surgeon give money to two rebel prisoners of war at the end as they were being released. And he, so he went up to the surgeon and he said, do you know those men? And he said, no, I've never met them before. But they gave me a sign and I know them to be my brothers. He said, well, will you ever get that money back? And he said, well, if they are of the ability to pay that money back to me, they will see to it that I get it. But I am not concerned about that because they are my brothers and they are in need. And it was in Brother McKinley's diary where he said, well, if that's what Freemasonry is about, then I'd like some of that for myself. Not unlike Brother McKinley, at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863, Elijah Hunt Rhodes was witness to a, a, rebel, gen, a rebel colonel, excuse me, that had been killed. And to quote his, um, his diary, a colonel of a Georgia rebel regiment was found dead upon the field. Captain Thomas Foy of our regiment discovered in some way that the colonel was a Mason, and with the assistance of some other Masons, buried him. 
As I am not a mason, I do not understand the matter. While the burial was going on, the skirmishes were constantly firing. Nine months after Gettysburg, in March 1864, Brother Rhodes was granted a furlough to go home. During that furlough, he was made a mason at Harmony Lodge No. 9 in Patuxet on March 29th. Following the third battle of Winchester in September 1864, Rhodes tells of another Masonic story that I will tell you in one second. I, I've looked to see in, in several sources why he was granted that furlough, and I really don't know. But one thing I found in the history of Harmony Lodge was um, a reason that I think could have been the, the, the cause of that. On September 8, 1863, Robert Rhodes, a member of Harmony Lodge No. 9 and a lieutenant in the United States Navy, was mortally wounded. He died on September 10th and was buried in Beaumont Cemetery on the Natchez River with Masonic and military honors and one company of Confederate soldiers acting as as escort. The Lodge history states that Harmony Lodge performed a funeral service for him on April 10, 1864. I, I, my guess is it would be what we would call a memorial service now because there couldn't have been a body there. Robert Rhodes was obviously a relative of Elijah Hunt Rhodes, who was not only initiated and passed on March 29th, but raised to the sublime degree of a Master Mason on April 6th. That's extremely fast to go from uh, an entered apprentice to a um, Master Mason, and I believe he received the furlough to attend the memorial service of his relative, maybe cousin, and received expedited degrees in order to be, take his part as a Mason, in part due to what he had seen on the field at Gettysburg. And that's where I go to the other quote from his, his diary. And it's, I found the body of my friend, Major James Q. Rice of the 2nd Connecticut Heavy Artillery, and had it buried by itself and shall try to send it home to his friends. He usually wore a fine Masonic pin, but someone had taken it from his coat. In fact, he had been robbed of everything of value. I cut a square and compass with his name, rank, and regiment upon the ammunition box cover and placed it at the head of his grave. Poor Rice. He was much older than I, but we were intimate, knowing each other as Masons and comrades. After the war, Brother Rhodes remained active in Freemasonry and served as Master of Harmony Lodge in 1885. In 1891, he had become active in Grand Lodge and was the subject of a biographical sketch written by Henry W. Rugg. The last paragraph of that sketch reads as follows. Brother Rhodes possesses the sterling qualities that mock the upright man, the worthy citizen, and the true craftsman. He has creditably filled a great number of important positions, Masonic and otherwise, and has deservedly gained the esteem and friendship of his associates and the public. He holds a warm place in the hearts of the Masonic fraternity of Rhode Island. Most worshipful Elijah Hunt Rhodes was elected Grand Master of Free and Accepted Masons of Rhode Island in 1893 and 1894. Most worshipful Rhodes laid the cornerstones of the new Masonic temples in East Greenwich and Westerly for King Solomon's and Franklin Lodges, respectively. During the ceremony in East Greenwich, Most Worshipful Rhodes quoted a wonderful little poem regarding the most enviable, enviable of all titles, the character of an honest man. It is attributed to Bayard Taylor and titled Fame. Fame is what you have taken. Character is what you give. When to this thought you waken, then you begin to live. The Grand Master also laid the cornerstone of the Ebenezer Primitive Methodist Church at the corner of Smith and Ruggles Streets in Providence. He was assisted in this by His Excellency, Governor Russell Brown. It struck me that we seldom hear our governors referred to as ex His Excellency today. The Grand Master and Governor were given matching and grave silver trowels to commemorate the occasion. In the year 1893, Most Worshipful Rhodes visited every lodge in the Grand Jurisdiction and several more than once, for a total of 53 visitations. Think about that for a moment. Over 120 years ago, well before the automobile, this man visited just over a lodge per week. These lodges were spread about the state, and though a good number were in the metro area, there were lodges in Woonsocket and Westerly, Chapachet and Situate, Coventry and Harrisville, Middletown and Newport before there were any bay bridges. Then there was Atlantic Lodge on Block Island. That couldn't have been a day trip in 1893. This brother obviously took the title of Most Worshipful Grand Master seriously. He made fewer visitations in 1894, but was an equally successful year. I'm sure Most Worshipful Elijah Hunt Rhodes completed his two terms as Grand Master with that sense of pride that can only come with a feeling of a job well done. 
In closing, we go back to May of 1917 when Most Worshipful Wilbur A. Scott concluded the Grand Lodge eulogy for Most Worshipful Elijah Hunt Rhodes as follows. He retained an active interest in the affairs of Grand Lodge to the time of his death, and I was pleased to count him as one of my warmest friends. I believe that he approximated as nearly my ideal of a true Mason as any man that I have ever known. May we all be remembered so fondly. Thank you. Most importantly, and that Colonel Rose was a strong man of faith. At this time, I would like to request the comments of the Reverend Dr. Evan Howard of the Community Church of Providence. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your invitation, Brian. Uh, I want to bring greetings from the congregation of the Community Church of Providence, which over the years has actually gone by many different names and uh, in all of its various incarnations since 1868 when uh, Elisha Hunt Rhodes first became a member of the church and stayed in membership uh, just about 50 years, almost 50 years. Uh, his name has been one that has been revered and uh, as pastor for now over 25 years, he gives me a lot of inspiration and uh, his name is held in high regard in our church. Uh, there's a stained glass window dedicated in his honor. And uh, we also have a meeting sp space where we gather for our weekly coffee hours known as Rhodes Hall. And uh, I feel that his two great grandsons who are here today, Robert Hunt Rhodes and uh, great great grandson, sorry, um, and Bob Chase have in a way adopted me into the family for which I, I very much uh, appreciate. They've been so supportive over all of these years. And uh, I've learned a lot today about Elisha Hunt Rhodes that I didn't actually know before in terms of his various uh, associations and memberships. And uh, it expands his legacy and even makes more meaningful uh, perhaps some of the underlying reasons that he was involved in the causes that he was involved in. And especially when I think of his character, his resilience, his loyalty, and his faithfulness, I ask, where did these qualities come from? And at the heart of everything was his Christian faith. Uh, after uh, coming back from the war in uh, 1866, he married Caroline, they were at the time members of the Patuxent Baptist Church, and they moved to Providence. And at that time, our congregation was known as the Central Baptist Church. But before that, uh, it had been founded in 1805, originally by some members from the First Baptist Church in America, which was led at the time by Stephen Gano, whose name you might recognize from the Gano Street exit uh, in Providence. And they decided that they needed to move to the east side of Providence where new homes were being built and it was a growing community. And so they envisioned this large project of establishing uh, the most majestic building that the church had ever known. And this is a place where it all kind of comes together uh, for me with uh, Elijah Hunt Rhodes' membership uh, in the Masons and his familiarity with building. He was a builder. And uh, the whole idea of building goes back into the scriptures uh, with King Solomon. It took over 100,000 people to build uh, the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, masons and uh, stonecutters and carpenters. And what an organizational uh, challenge that must have been. And the same when they had to come back after the exile under Nehemiah to rebuild the wall that had been destroyed by the Babylonians and to construct the second temple. And so our church in uh, 1915, under the leadership, when they looked for someone who was going to undertake this project, who could head up the building of this new structure, they chose Elisha Hunt Rhodes. He had the organizational ability. He had the respect of the community for the fundraising that was needed. 
and he oversaw more than a hundred meetings uh, in order to um, purchase the land, in order to organize all of the stonework. If you go to the corner of Lloyd and Whalen Avenues today, you will see a building that takes up about a block, and it has a tower that stands about 100 uh, feet tall. It is still quite a, a monument uh, on, on the east side, and uh, without Elisha Hunt Rhodes, it never would have happened. And, and Elisha Hunt Rhodes, I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to fight in all of those battles. And every day for those four years to have his life be in danger. And yet he went on with courage and with extraordinary bravery because he had laid his foundation on that rock. That foundation which is Jesus Christ our Lord who continues to say to us, I am the Good Shepherd. I am the resurrection and the light. I am the light of the world. And those who follow me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Thank you to Elijah Hunt Rhodes for living an extraordinary Christian life and for leaving us a legacy that even a hun almost a hundred years after your death continues to inspire us to follow as you did in the path of the light of the world. Thank you. Amen. by detail. Number one.
Let us pray. And now may you go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you and inspire you as Elisha Hunt Rhodes was inspired to live with faithfulness, loyalty, and resilience and become an instrument of God's peace. And may you remember that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint until that day when they no longer see through a glass dimly, but face to face the glory of God in Jesus Christ, whose kingdom is eternal and whose love never fails. Amen. 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 On behalf of Major Gio, members of the Rhodes family, and the various organizations and individuals who participated here today, thank you so much for your support and attendance. That concludes our ceremony.